Oh well, we are at Speakers Corner one Sunday morning. It's around 11 o'clock and we have brother Jason Burns with us. Peace of Christ be with you, brother. How are you? God bless you. Thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be with you, Hatu, and the team. God bless you. So um, I know you are traveling all the way from Manchester and I know you left 12 o'clock midnight to be here today. Yes. So yes. Um, it is always a blessing to have you at Speakers Corner alongside with us. So thank you. So what brought you to Speakers Corner, besides my invitation? <laughs> uh, to preach the gospel, <laughs> to share the gospel, to be with your team, and uh, just to just, uh, share the love of Christ today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so, you were at Speakers Corner a couple of weeks ago. Yes. yes. And um, you had a debate with a um, Muslim called Mohammed Hijab. Yeah. If you have a time, we just go through a couple of points Mohammed Hijab made on the debate. Okay. Okay. So. Um, as I acknowledge that Mohammed Hijab claims to be Muslim, yes, yes, I noticed all the questions he put forward were not any of the Muslim questions. So he wasn't using any of the Muslim arguments. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I'm going to touch them a little bit later. But can you just tell me quickly? Can you just tell me quickly what was how was your feelings after the debate? How did the debate go? Um, well, I, I thought the debate went well. Um, but at the end, I, I did think he, he, he was playing his uh, Islamic Dawa tricks <laughs> at the end. Yeah, welcome from, to the world. <laughs> apart from that, uh, the debate uh, was a, a generally a good debate till at the end when he was uh, not being friendly but slipping into his old tricks. Yeah, so he was using mainly liberal arguments regarding the authority of the Bible and the scripture. Yes, yes. Um, before we start, um, go through all the kind of couple of points he made, um, can, can I just ask you, what is scripture for? The scripture, well, I, I just want to read this. It's uh, 2 Timothy yep. uh, 3.16. It says, at verse 15, sorry, it says, 2 Timothy 3.15, And that from a child thou knowest the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So first thing, scripture makes us wise to salvation. And verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the uh, word uh, scripture is, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is God, bre God breathed out the scripture. And Luther said the Bible is the cradle where Christ is laid. So the, from beginning to end, it's a story of redemption, of how God has brought redemption to mankind in yeah. Christ. And also, as Paul says, scripture, you know, he's talking about Old Testament and New Testament. Because, yes. um, again, in 1 Timothy, Paul addresses Luke as the part of the scripture. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yes. Old Testament and New Testament is the word of God. Can, can I just interrupt there just sure. a second? This is really important, what Hatum said. A lot, a lot of people, when they read that passage, they say it's about the Old Testament, but not a lot of people know that actually Paul in this in this book quotes Luke as scripture. Yeah. Like you can, said. I, can I read that? Yes. So that's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. For scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the gain, grain, and the workers deserve their wages. So Paul gives us quotation from the Old Testament alongside of giving us quotation from Luke chapter Amen. 8, it's chapter 10. Sorry, that's Luke chapter 10. So, Old Testament and New Testament is the Word of God, inspired Word of God, written um, within 1,400 years gap, mm -hmm. approximately 40 different people in lots of different parts of the world. Um, so, um, as Muhammad Hijab was challenging you regarding who give authority, Yes, for yes. Bible to put together. So we know at the time of Jesus, yes, we didn't yes. have Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> at the time of Jesus, we didn't have Genesis to Revelation as the 66 uh, books of, of the Bible. So how did we get the book I am holding in my hand? Well, it says here in John 14, 26, and six, uh, John 16, 13, 14, it says, but the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. 
So the Lord gave authority to, to his apostles and to, his, uh, to, to those at the time to write scripture. That's the authority there that he would teach them. Yeah. So the authority is ultimately resided first of all in God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God testifies to his word. But they, the people who wrote it, uh, had, had authority because they were called of God as well. Uh, so, in, oh. while uh, Spirit of God um, intentionally involves for Word of God to put together, yeah, yeah. as he engages with the disciples and apostles within the first century, within yeah, the first yeah. century, yeah. Bible tells us, therefore, Bible is the Word of God. God yeah. Yeah. personally got involved yeah. what we are reading today. Yeah. Yeah. So, since um, we know the uh, latest book of the Bible, uh, John Gospel, are you agreeing with me? The, Late, written yeah, around 90, yeah, 1995 yeah, AD, which is approximately 60 years after the death of Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Um, and when the New Testament was put together, we know disciples were around, and soon after the death of disciples, no one had a right to say what's supposed to be in the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You agreeing with me on that? I totally yeah. agree, yeah. Okay, so since um, Spirit of God is actively involved for the Word of God to put together, what was the argument, um, can you remind me, what was the argument Mohammed Hijab was putting, for, putting forward regarding the Athanasius? Uh, what what he was saying, uh, what uh, what Hijab, Muhammad Hijab was saying is that that who had authority to bring the list, and so he used um, uh, Athanasius as an example of bringing a list, and he was challenging Athanasius, saying, "How come you've got the authority to make this list of twenty-seven okay. books?" Okay, let me ask basics. What is the date for Athanasius? I can't, I can't remember off. off okay, I, I, 350s. 350s, after, yeah, yeah. 300s. And um, when did Jesus die? Uh, 31. 31, 33 30, AD. Yeah. Uh, last gospel is 90 AD. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there is approximate over 200 years gap yeah, between yeah. the last gospel to Athanasius. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he never met Jesus. No. He no. never met the apostles. No. Okay. And Muhammad Hijab was making a point actually books of Bible in a sense authorized. Books of Bible is authorized by Athanasius who never met with Jesus and who never met with disciples. Yeah. Yeah, that's what he was saying. Um, I'll ask you a very basic question. Have you ever been to British British Library? Uh, I have. I have. What do we have in British Library? Um, Something dated before Athanasius. Is it Sinaiticus or yeah, Codex, Codex Sinaiticus? Yes, yes. Uh, dated around 325, and it is before Athanasius. Yes, yes, yes. So Athanasius did not put together this supposed to be in the Bible. Mm. He just shares the information with us what people are using, mm, mm. because we do have writings and physical Bible before Athanasius in our in our hands yeah. today in British Library. Yeah. 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 So what is your quick response to uh, Muhammad Hijab's argument? Well basically what you've been saying is basically it goes it goes much earlier, it goes into the first century. Yeah. The, the passage that you quoted in uh, Timothy 1 Timothy 5 18. Uh, yeah shows you that already there was a canon already in existence yeah. then. Uh, then there's 2 Peter chapter 3 where uh, Peter refers to Paul's Paul's letters of scripture. Yeah. Uh, then you have, um, we have uh, the, at, uh, at Ryland's Library, we have a, a fragment of the Gospel of John, John chapter 18, which, which shows you that yeah. it was uh, written in the first century. Um, then we have quotations of uh, the Didache, Ignatius, Polycarp. These are just coming at the end of the first first century, beginning of the second, second century, century. Yeah. all quoting most of the New Testament when you put them all together. So there was already uh, a canon, there was also, uh, they also loved to, to use codex. Uh, after papyri they loved to use codex and that was a unanimous thing that they did and that's like a book form. And a book form 
means that they collected books like you said uh, with the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So already in the first century through Polycarp, through uh, Ignatius, through the Didache, there's, there's vast quotations of the New Testament going on. And then when you get into the second century, you have Irenaeus who says that uh, the four corners of the world is Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So you get Tertullian and other early church fathers later in the second century, Origen, and basically most of the New Testament is quoted yeah. within the first 100, 200 years. And then you have the Moratorium Fragment, uh, which is about 180, 200 AD, which quotes most of the New Testament. So there was already a canon in existence way, way before Athanasius. And then yeah. when you read Athanasius' letter, it's very interesting what he says. He refers to Athanasius' letter as div uh, Athanasius refers to the scriptures as divine, so he recognizes their inherent authority, yeah. and then he says, but they were passed on to us, and then he recognizes the authority of the early church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was too much wind <laughs> over there. So, um, overall, Spirit of God personally involved for us to have the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. And scripture comes to us from people who engaged with Jesus, who know Jesus, yeah, yeah, and yeah. who were who spent time with the apostles. Yeah, and that yeah. takes place within the first century. But um, I was disappointed that Muhammad Hijab yeah. ignored the Islamic teachings and went the liberal scholars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to kind of bring those arguments forward. So, do you know the source of the um, questions, where it comes from? Yeah, they, they, they're getting it from uh, uh, Bart Ehrman. But Bart Ehrman gets it from a guy called Walter Bauer. Walter Bauer was in the 1930s. And he, he, he gave this theory that there was no such thing as orthodoxy, that there was just diversity. And this idea of diversity uh, was when they when scholar he was in the 1930s but when his book he was German when his book was published in in the UK in the 60s it, it massively impacted academia and Bart Ehrman has taken Walter Bauer's ideas and popularized them so what that means is when Bart Ehrman looks at hit church history right at the start there's no such thing as orthodoxy it's all diversity so when Mohammed Hijab comes along and starts debating with us He's using Bar Ehrman, and he can't look at the data, the evidence, the historical evidence. He's just got to say it's all diverse, it was all invented. He can't see that the, the, there was such thing as an orthodoxy, which we have demonstrated today by showing you the words of Jesus, that Jesus, our Lord, gave authority to his disciples, and that there was an early church, that, that community, where books were written by apostles and people who knew by apostles in the first century and orthodoxy was already there because when you look at all the early church fathers Ignatius, uh, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Tertullian, all of them they were all conscious that they were heterodox people so the whole theory when you start to the, when you start to look at the New Testament like Revelations chapter 1, 2 and 3 shows you there were churches sound uh, Galatians chapter 1 shows you that Paul was saying cursed as anyone who doesn't preach the gospel it's clear that there were churches holding on to orthodox teaching Paul says in Colossians read my letters out in uh, 1 Thessalonians he says uh, you receive these my words as the word of God so there are, once you start to study the New Testament you see there is an orthodoxy if there is an orthodoxy that orthodoxy wanted to make sure that it, the gospel was secure and that security comes through the Word of God, uh, the inspiration of the Word of God. Uh, let me point out something. Um, Mohammed Hijab, in his conversation with you, he was um, expressing um, Gnostics. Yes, yes. Um, can you just remind us when they were written? The Why no we are not using them? The Gnostics, <laughs> the Gnostics came after the, after the four Gospels. They came... Uh, I, Mainly from second century. They came from second century, but if you get hold of the Nag Hammami uh, uh, book, which has got most of the Gnostic Gospels in, I've read them all. I read all the Gnostic Gospels and I tabulated the notes. And what you find is the Gnostic Gospels quote 
the New Testament. The New Testament never quote these Gnostic Gospels. So that's categorical evidence. I'll give you an example. The Gnostic Gospels, they know very little of Jerusalem and the area uh, of, of Jerusalem. They mention Jerusalem in all the Gnostic Gospels a handful of times. The four Gospels mention Jerusalem over 66 times. They know intricately the writers, where the gates are, the pools are, everything. So it's obvious that these people who wrote these Gnostic Gospels, that they were later. The other thing about the Gnostic Gospels is that, and the Gnostic writers, is there was no uniformity. Some were philosophical, some were like Stoics, some were like mystics. So there was no uniformity where there was always a uniformity of orthodoxy, the, apo the apostolic creed, the idea, the belief that Christ died and rose again, that Christ is the Son of God, was uniform all around the ancient world as, as, a, as a church where the Gnostics were not a uniform group. There were different types of groups, different views, philosophical views following Greek philosophy, some following uh, Mithraism, and uh, there we are. So, so the Gnostic Gospels are not good historical material. They come later, they quote the Gospels, they quote the New Testament, and um, so when Muslims are, or any, any scholar or anybody using the Gnostic Gospels, they're not really being good scholars. Yeah. I think um, as a Christian, I did very limited um, study on this, but since they are written very, very late, by people who never spent time with Jesus, yes, yes. By, by people who never witnessed what happened and contains lots of historical mistakes, it, it is very difficult to come to the conclusion that Spirit of God is personally involved to the Gnostic yeah, Gospels. Yeah. And even liberal scholars would acknowledge that they were never part of the Christian um, scripture. Um, so while <laughs> I must express, I was very, very disappointed that I grieved um, once again to see Mohammed Hijab. Actually, he was claiming to be la uh, Muslim last week. Mm. Probably, it seems as he, was, as he was debating with you, he wasn't acting like a Muslim because the way he questioned the authority of the scripture, mm. the way he questioned the authority, uh, authority of the authors, he simply went against Islam. Yeah. He simply discredited the Quran, he simply discredited Muhammad, and he sim simply discredited Allah. Yeah. Because while Quran acknowledges Bible to the be, be the word of God, and it is the same Quran which is exists in seventh century confirms the Bible we have. Mm, mm. So why Muslims come up with these very disturbing arguments? <laughs> because the, 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 the reason why in Surah 634 it says my word cannot change and the context of that chapter is the prophets. So it's quite clear it's, it's, it's the prophets of all, all the past not just uh, Muhammad. So it says my word cannot change. So there are many many scriptures as you know there's at least 33 or more that, that refer to the Old and New Testament as the Word of God in the Quran. And the Muslims come along and they start to question scripture. And the reason why they do it is because they slip into atheism rather than faith. They become schizophrenic. Rather than being consistent with their own revelation, they come out of their own revelation, what, what they believe is revelation, we, we don't believe it's a revelation, and they slip into rationalism and atheism. And, and the schizophrenic. So Allah doesn't have problem with Bible. Allah doesn't have problem with the New Testament and Old Testament. No. Muhammad doesn't have problem with the Bible, New Testament and Old Testament. And Quran has a lot of respect to the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, Allah never questions who give authority to any of the church fathers. Allah doesn't even kind of bother to mention Church fathers. A good point. <laughs> but yeah. in somehow, in somehow, yeah. Muslim thinks, th for the sake of the argument, they can discredit their own scripture, they can butcher their God, they can butcher their prophet, and use those atheist arguments against Bible. Yeah. That's disturbing. Yeah. I, do, yeah. I do get disturbed a lot um, because of that. Um, also, one of the things um, Mohammed Hijab was mentioning in his debate with you, he was challenging the councils. Yes, yes. Um, he got lots of things wrong. Um, I'll go through them like in another time where he, he tells those councils took place 
before the Council of Nicaea, yet they took place after the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. But can you just summarize for Christians to be more confident about what, for example, what is the Council of Nicaea all about? Is it really as Muslims claim they brought the Bibles together and then they picked which one is the best one? Does it even have no, to do anything the, with it? The, the Council of Nicaea, there was a battle going on in, in, in the empire at the time between Arian, Arian, Arians, which are like the Jehovah's Witness today, you say that Jesus was a man, or, or Jesus was not God, and the Orthodox who said that Jesus was God in the flesh, and there was a battle to try and win the heart of the empire, and Constantine called uh, the Council of Nicaea. Now, when he called the Council of Nicaea, many of the bishops, what people don't realize, many of those bishops have been through persecution They've been burnt, they've been beaten, they've been battered left, right and centre. So there were many of them were men of God who were, were not frightened of political leaders. They just wanted to say what the word of God said. So the the idea, what, what Muhammad Hijab was saying was this, this, this belief that we have about Jesus, about the Bible, it's all political. It was all created political. But the bishops just wanted to say what the, what, what the Bible taught and the, the, the Nicaea was about who Christ was. Was he uh, God incarnate? Was he God in the flesh? And the, the main guy behind Nicaea was the secretary, who was Athanasius. He was behind the scenes trying to encourage people to keep to the faith. And a lot of atheists, internet atheists, and a lot of Muslims today, uh, Dawah teams, they don't do proper scholarship, they don't read the sources. I asked Muhammad Hijab, have you ever read Athanasius? I've read his commentaries. I've read uh, his uh, Against the World, uh, which is called Against the World, which is his book on the Incarnation. He's never read these books. And he's talking about Athanasius. And a lot of internet atheists, a lot of Muslim Dawah teams, they don't actually read the sources. And if you read the sources, the Nicaea is about the deity of Christ it's nothing to do about the Bible, yep. putting the Bible together. That's a myth created by internet atheists and Islamic Dawah teams. And also, um, one of the points Muhammad Hijab was trying to make is, you never, um, in the Council of Nicaea, Holy Spirit wasn't God. Because, that, because people didn't discuss it, therefore he wasn't God. Um, I think it's helpful for Muslims to remember this once for all. As people to put together the Christian doctrine, they formulated it, they used something called Bible. So they went to Bible, they look at what Bible teaches about identity of Jesus, what Bible teaches about deity, um, identity of Holy Spirit. Therefore, they come to the conclusion that Christians believe in Trinitarian God. It had, it had nothing to do with like, oh, people discussed that in 300 years after the death of Jesus. No, That's I, just a disappointing argument. I think it's important because Muhammad Hijab uses this argument that, and, and the Muslim Dawah teams use the argument like the Holy Spirit only became God to the Christians like two, three hundred years later. But if you look at the last chapter of Matthew, it says, go into all the world made disciples in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it, the, there was already a belief in the Trinity it, it, there, so right at the beginning of the early church. So the idea that it was created is ridiculous. Yeah, even it goes much, much before that. At the time of Moses, when yeah, we look at yeah. the numbers, yeah, yeah. we see Holy Spirit is identified as Yahweh himself. Yeah, yeah. Same for Word of God in the Old Testament as identified Lord himself. Yeah. So those are just silly arguments. Dawah team is intentionally bringing it up and making more videos about it. Yeah. M making more videos about it, which is pretty disappointed to mankind, actually. But it, it, it's, it, it's internet scholarship. <laughs> Google, check Google. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay. So um, one of the thing, um, it was unescapable to be seen that as you were responding Mohammed Hijab's question uh, you start keeping him accountable for what Islamic tradition tells us about the Quran and even about Hadith 
one of the disturbing thing is today there are lots of different groups in Islam, Shiites and Sunnis. Yeah, they yeah. don't even agree regarding the biography of their own prophet. Mm. Shia account gives us different biography of Muhammad. Sunni account gives us different biography of Muhammad. Mm. And both of them were put together approximately 250 years yeah. after death of their prophet. Yeah. That's very disturbing. And they were put together by people who never met Muhammad, who never met with the first Sahabis, disciples of Muhammad. Yeah. Yet yeah. in somehow, Muslims blindly following that. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. ask the question who give authority to Bukhari to put the Sahih Bukhari account together, yeah. I don't think we will have any answer to that question. But can you just summarize for me as you kept Muhammad Hijab accountable um, on the chains of the Quran and the chains of the Hadiths? Uh, Quran doesn't have the chains, but chains of the hadith. So what well, happened? Well, the thing the thing is, is when, he took it personal. When we when we do when we <laughs> do historical studies, we we take objective criteria. We take the what the scholars' criteria is. Like for example, when we're doing historical studies, we use uh, the enemy of test uh, uh, enemy of attestation. So for example, to verify that Christ died on a cross. We, we can use enemies like Josephus and Tatitus. So we're using the best scholarship and the best scholarly methods. And our sources are solid sources. There are sources like the Gospels are rooted in history. They're rooted in eyewitness material. For example, uh, Luke, when he says eyewitness, the word eyewitness, there the Greek word is, is from uh, Polybius, who was 200 years before uh, Luke, who, who said, if you're going to do good history, have eyewit good eyewitness material. So a good historian in the first century wants to get eyewitness material. Now, sorry, so I need to break down the definition of the eyewitness. Yes. What yes. does that mean? Because Muslims use the same phrase. And I think it was last week I was told Bukhari was eyewitness to Muhammad because he heard what people said to said said. Okay. Is that like in that sense eyewitness no, or? No, no, no. Well, uh, when Luke says he collected eyewitness, the eye, he uses the Greek word that Polybius used, which means as a historian, you go and talk, talk to people <laughs> who actually knew Jesus or met Jesus and got the material. Whereas Bukhari, uh, it's 200 years old. Yeah, after, 250 yeah. years after the death then, of Muhammad. And then the first copy of Bukhari. It's 1300, not complete. 1300. Only, only, I think, a couple of chapters of it. So when you compare the gospel which is eyewitness and we have a, 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 we have a, a pit of Ryland's uh, library from 110, 115, 120 AD. Let's go approximate 120. 120, yeah. Compare that eyewitness material and first part, first pit, fragment. Um, fragment is 120 to Bukhari who was not an eyewitness. Uh, who lived uh, very, very far from Saudi Arabia. So he came 200 <coughs> years after. Approximately, yeah. 200 years after. <coughs> so he's not an eyewitness. And then we get our first copy uh, 800 years later. Is it? Yeah, but issues, there is some manuscripts dated on 1300, but they are canonized, canonized Sahih Bukhari is 1880. So like 1900. 19th century. That's wow. awful if you look at just tradition of Bukhari. Wow. And when it comes to Bukhari, actually, it's very disturbing. Bukhari puts together completion of the um, completion um, of the stories, and then from him, he's got four students. Okay, and students are talking. They disagree with one another. Wow. Wow. And then something happens. Miracle happens in Islam. Those three um, three writings, three students' writings, just get lost in somehow, and then we've got one student. From that, this one student, you've got 17 students, and who doesn't have the same Sahih Bukhari? Oh. And the current Sahih, Bu Sahih Bukhari we have has nothing to do with Sahih Bukhari. Wow, that's wow. just so, messed up. But anyway, so you could say a chain chain of narration is just basically chain of fabrication. When yes. You start looking. At the historical sources, Islamic historiography is a joke. It really is a joke. Destroys the history. It, 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 it's not <laughs> even in the game. And they're, they're lying to you, Mansour and Mohammed Hijab. 
they're just totally lying to you or they, they really don't know what they're talking about. Um, on another topic, so while in somehow Muslims or Dawatim don't like to be kept accountable for what they are saying, it's pretty disturbing actually, but um, I noticed while back you did some uh, study on the Quranic manuscript. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Muslims are um, very famously caught out a couple of times that Quran has the awesome chains of the narrations. Yeah. Okay. Can you just tell me who are the narrator of the top Kapu Musaf? The top couple. Top Kapu Musaf. You, you know more. That, no, there is no. So yeah, that's yeah. supposed to be the chain of narrations which comes from centuries to yeah, centuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when we look at the earliest manuscripts, we don't see any of those people's name yeah, in yeah. front of the manuscripts while they officialized Hafs Quran in 1924. Yeah, yeah. Today we know it has nothing to do with Muhammad. Well, in, in the Cambridge Companion to the Quran, which is one of the most prestigious pieces of work done on the Quran, it says in there, categorically, the scholars say there has never been a critical textual edition yep. of the Quran ever made. So when Mansour and the Muslims Dawa teams come here and they critique us about textual variants, they're not even in the game because they're not intellectually honest. They've never even done a critical edition. The only people that were honest were people like uh, Tabari, who acknowledged that there were textual issues. Yep. But, but the Muslim world today, they're not doing textual criticism on the Quran. And if you look at the Sana, the top copy, if you look at all the earliest manuscripts, they've got verses missing, there are textual variants. And if you go into, um, if you go into the history of these hadiths, which aren't very good anyway, but if you go into these hadiths, there's loads of evidence to show that there are different manuscripts and different textual variants. And it's a nightmare that they don't want you to know, they hide it from you. I think in one sense, I'm not that much bothered about they are ashamed of putting together the critical version, additional of the Quran, but I am more bothered about even today what they have, which according to them is the perfect, even they disagree on that. Muslims said speakers gonna day after week after week, they discredit part of Sahih Bukhari. They discredit part of Sahih Muslim. Yeah, and yeah. now, like you do have Muslims at in early stage of my time at speakers corner, they were like proper Sunni Muslims, Quran and Hadith. Yeah. But now they becoming more like half of the Hadith versus full Quran. Very soon they will be Quran only Muslims because. As they look at the biography of Muhammad, as they look at the customs of Muhammad, they do get the disturbed, all those teachings, and then they start discrediting. And in 21st century, they are simply telling us, oh, actually, that's not correct. And there is no way they can find out if that is correct or not today. That's like yeah, another disturbing yeah. part of Islamic history. There's a, a Muslim scholar called Dr. Salim who's done a PhD on uh, the, on the uh, early hadiths and how they relate to the yeah. formation of the Quran. And basically, it, it's so bad, the evidence is so bad, he's saying we shouldn't use the hadiths anymore because it, if we do, it'll just discredit the Quran. Oh, um, scholars can make those claims, but it would be very dangerous if Muslims give up the hadith because they wouldn't even able to practice their daily life. Without yeah, hadith, yeah, yeah, they yeah. cannot be Muslim anyway. Yeah. So, overall, what we have here, we have the word of God which we hold in our hands. And as we looked at in the Timothy account, that it is for our salvation. And we look at the word of God, and word of God, which, has, which is the breath of God, gives us what the word of God himself did for us on the cross. We look at the Bible and we see, Bible tells us in the beginning, man and woman, sin against God, sin against one another, mm -hmm. and we did something very, very wrong and bad. We sinned against God, and the eternal word of God, Lord Jesus Christ, steps in and then gives up his life for mankind on the cross so that man and wo woman can have eternal life mm -hmm. with God through the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. Bible gives us those teachings. Without Bible, we would be standing here and then saying, yep, what's happening in this world? What is the mm -hmm. source of 
this mess and this broken world. Mm.